morning and welcome. My name's Tim from the Bromley North Congregation. At the beginning of the year, I started reading a small book by John Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. And it's all about welcoming Jesus. And he reminds us of what Jesus says about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. But he hangs the whole book off one verse, which is found in John chapter 6, verse 37. And it says this, anyone that comes to me i will not cast out that means i won't push them away i won't reject them now this is of vital importance because the promises of jesus of new life in him are for anybody that truly welcomes jesus as lord so this morning as we enter into the service i'd like you to remember and act on one small phrase and that's this, welcome Jesus. As we worship, welcome Jesus. As we listen to Tony preaching, welcome Jesus. Why? Because I know Jesus will not disappoint you this morning. He is the way, the truth and the life. Secondly, I know that Jesus will be with you. As you welcome him, you will sense his presence coming alongside you, building you up and strengthening you. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that true life is found in you and that you do not disappoint us. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come and come alongside us and point us to Jesus. So have a great morning as we welcome Jesus together. Ha 
hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. You 
Draw me close to you Never let me go Lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing that can take your place Feel the warmth of your embrace And help me find a way Bring me back to you Oh, yeah. 
crushing in the pressing you are making new life in the soul I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I Just do I don't need to understand So make me a vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus bring new wine in the pressing you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I Make me a vessel, make me 
to be and I came here with nothing but all you have given me Jesus bring So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Hi. As we were worshipping this morning, in our Sunday morning Zoom meeting, I kept getting a picture of uh, an enormous figure in a long mantle, like a, a massive long cloak. And as they were walking around, this cloak was touching people. In some cases, people were hiding underneath this mantle uh, as protection from the storm. And I was saying to God, what is this? What is this mantle? And at that moment, uh, one of our congregation, um, Catherine Golding, had a picture about God's blessings and, and people claiming the blessings that God has for them. And at that moment, it's, it's like the Holy Spirit answered that prayer about what is the mantle and said to me, it is the mantle of God's blessing. I believe God was saying that from now forward as we go into 2021 it's the the year and the time of the mantle of God's blessing the time when his mantle of blessing is going to fall on you and I believe that's for us corporately but in a special way for any individual listening to this right now or whether you heard it this morning uh, when I first shared it um, it's for you and for some people that might be to do with things you've been praying for and maybe a blessing you've been praying for for many years. Maybe some people have kind of almost given up on it or sort of kind of lost hope. And God would say, no, today is the day of the mantle of my blessing, the day that my mantle of blessing will fall on you. Now is a time when you need to rise up in faith and prepare to receive that blessing uh, from me because I'm walking in your direction. I'm walking amongst you in these days and uh, the mantle of my blessing is going to fall on you. Hallelujah. Get ready. Thanks, Tony, for that wonderful encouragement. It's so exciting to hear that God wants his mantle of blessing to fall upon each one of us. And we need to be ready to receive that and everything he wants for each one of us in 2021. My name is Julian and I'm one of the elders at Hope Orpington and I just want to tell you about the week of prayer we've organised uh, starting on Sunday 24th of January and running through to the following weekend. At Hope we are committed to prayer. It is absolutely the heart of everything we're about and for some time now we've run a week of prayer at the beginning of January each new year. You don't need me to tell you that this year more than any other year we need to be praying together as a church. We need to set aside time in our calendar to come before God, to commit ourselves before him afresh, to ask him to speak to us and guide us in the year ahead, to pray for our nation as we have never prayed for our nation before, that people will realise their need of a saviour in these days. We're going to pray for revival across the UK in 2021. And as Tony has already mentioned, I'm delighted that someone has already committed their life to the Lord Jesus in this past week. And we want to be praying that many, many more of our friends, our neighbours, our families, and people that we don't yet know will come to faith during this year. And my longing is that, like just in Acts, we will see people come to faith on a daily basis across Hope Church. And that means just roughly one person per congregation per week. How exciting would that be? Is that possible? Of course it's possible. All things are possible with our God. And we need to be ready. My question to you today is, are we ready for what God wants to do amongst us in 2021? What better way to get ready than to join us at the week of prayer, beginning on Sunday, 24th of January? 
we set up a number of different ways to pray. Uh, we'll be launching with a whole church prayer meeting on Zoom on a Sunday evening, and we want everybody to be there, to be on that Zoom meeting so we can launch well. We'll be running an encounter evening on Monday night. We'll be praying during the day on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we'll be praying again as a whole church, encouraging everybody to join us on Zoom to pray. And then on Thursday, we'll be running a continuous prayer session between 6 p.m. Thursday evening and 6 p.m. Friday evening. And then we're going to uh, finish our week of prayer with a prayer meeting Friday night when we will be praying into the words, the prophecies, and the testimonies that have come out during that continuous prayer session. Details of the various meetings will come up at the end of a service or will be circulated via each of the congregation and WhatsApp groups in the coming days. Can I urge you in these challenging days to join with us to pray, to see God's face and to hear him speak to us at the beginning of 2021. Why is a dead Jesus good news? How could he who died bring a gospel? That is the puzzle people were trying to solve, at least the people who followed Jesus. And Mark wrote his book to help them put together the pieces. By recording everything from Jesus' speeches to him healing diseases, Mark proves his thesis that the death of Jesus is actually good news. When Jesus spoke with people, it was often about God's kingdom, but mixed in were also predictions about his own crucifixion. The speeches Mark includes prepared us for how his death could be good news. When Jesus speaks of forgiveness, it's like he's visiting inmates in prison to show that true imprisonment is to sin and its punishments. Jesus has the authority to offer forgiveness, but it would be his death that would accomplish it. When Jesus drove out demons, he was proclaiming the coming of his kingdom by taking territory ruled by his enemies' legions. This was a depiction of the victory he would win through his crucifixion. When Jesus healed the sick, he was showing how he would heal death itself. When he cleansed a leper or raised a daughter from her deathbed, he was pointing to his own death and resurrection. That's why Jesus dying is good news. That's how he would bring the gospel. Because all the actions Mark describes point us to the fact that Jesus would be handed over to the scribes and the chief priests, and then by the Romans be crucified. The king was betrayed and arrested, though we were the ones who committed the crimes. He was put through a false trial, which should have been yours and mine. He went to the spiritually possessed and freed them, was himself treated like a madman and beaten. Finally, he was taken outside the city where he would give his life as a ransom for many. For the sickness he altered, he took in his flesh. The enemies he conquered, he no longer suppressed. The forgiveness he offered, he paid for its debt. The kingdom he fostered, he brought through his death. So why is a dead Jesus part of the gospel? How could he who died bring good news? Because without his death, we stand accused. But by his death, we are made new. That's what Mark wants us to see in the death of Jesus, that his cross was all part of God's plan to free us. So when Mark leaves us there at the site where Jesus died, with the women at the tomb silent, terrified, and confused, there seems to be a question Mark leaves behind as his gospel concludes. After seeing all Jesus did and all his work pointed to, Mark leaves us with the death of Jesus and seems to ask, do you believe this is good news? Hey, good morning and happy new year from me to you. I really pray that 2021 has started uh, in a real uh, great way for you. It's not the year we imagined. I know for many of us, we'd hoped to be moving out of lockdown. We certainly didn't expect to still be online. But I tell you this, I'm so confident 
that through this year, God has many great things in store for you, for me, and for us as a people. And I'm excited to be starting our new teaching series in the book of Mark. It's Mark's gospel. It was the first gospel wrote, and it's also one of the shortest gospels. And it's Peter's account of his journey with Jesus. It was described by many commentators as the F1 driver of the Gospels. What he means is, it's like Mark puts his foot on the accelerator and he doesn't let up. Another commentator says, it's like running a marathon at the speed of a sprint. And you get that when you look at it. When you look through the book of Mark, through the Gospel of Mark, one word comes out again and again and again. And that word is immediately. In fact, in 16 short chapters, Mark uses this word 42 times. And in fact, the first chapter which we're looking at today, he uses it eight times. It is a gospel which demonstrates the good news of Jesus. The good news that the kingdom has come. And the kingdom is focused in this immediate arrival of Jesus. Let's just look at chapter 1 and see how it comes up. You see, because Mark does dispenses with the Christmas story, you get no kings, no magi, no shepherds, none of that from Mark. No, no, no. You don't get Jesus' childhood. Jesus just arrives with John the Baptist announcing he's here. In verse 10, it says, after he was baptised, immediately the heavens began to tore apart and the Spirit descended like a dove. A couple of verses later, as the baptism ends, it says, immediately the Spirit took Jesus to the wilderness. As he comes out of the wilderness, it says, immediately he was by the slight side of the uh, lake, and he called his first disciples and said, come and follow. Immediately they came with him. This rhythm of immediately follows through the whole chapter. So we get to the passage which we will turn to today, where Jesus arrives in Capernaum, immediately going to the temple. And just as he's teaching, immediately a man who is possessed arrives. No soon as that is finished, he arrives at Peter's home and immediately brings healing to his mother-in-law. This immediacy of Jesus runs through this gospel. And I want to say to you that Jesus' power and Jesus' presence is still immediate for us today. What I mean by that is his incarnation, his presence, although his physical body is no longer here, but in heaven, by his Holy Spirit, he is at work in our lives. Do you know that? Do you know that the promises that we're going to read, the evidence of the actions of Jesus at work, are still at work today? Mark wants us to know that whenever Jesus is present, something immediate is going to happen. He is the main event, Mark wants us to know. He is the focus in the room. He is the one who has arrived and we know something good is about to happen. He's saying, stop, come here, come be part of this story. The good news, Jesus says, his opening words in chapter 1 of this gospel is this, that the good news has come. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and follow. That same word is true for us. The kingdom is here. The good news of the kingdom is here. Verse 15, come and follow me. Come and follow me, says Jesus. And as soon as he says that to the disciples, he says, I will make you fishers of men. You see, our coming to Jesus leads us to going to others. The kingdom, the immediacy of Jesus at work in our lives, in your life and mine, brings us to him and then takes us to other people. And it's hallmarked by the authority of Jesus. Jesus has full authority. As we go through Mark's gospel over this coming 14 weeks, 
we're going to see again and again as Peter strips back all of the narrative and comes to the evidence of Jesus' power at work that he has full authority. He has full authority to teach. In our passage today, we will see that, that Jesus was one who had full authority. He brings revelation. But he also has authority to deliver the captive. Authority to forgive and bring release to others. Authority over sickness, over nature, and even over death. So let's turn to our gospel and let's turn to uh, verse 21 of chapter 1. I just want to read a few verses to you. And they went to Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. And he taught as one who had authority, not like the scribes. And immediately there was there in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing the man, cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned each of themselves. Who is this? A new kind of teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. Jesus arrives in Capernaum. This is a little town, a fishing town, just a few miles from where Jesus grew up in Nazareth. It was a beautiful place, actually. It had a, a lovely view of the lake. There were fishing boats. There was a, a Roman garrison there, but it, it, they had built a synagogue for the believers. It's not a city, though. It's a, it's a town. It's a thousand people or thereabouts. And Jesus arrives and goes straight to the synagogue. He goes straight to the center of, of, of the community and he begins to teach. And it says of Jesus that they were amazed or astounding at his teaching. He was better than the scribes. <laughs> Are they saying he's just a better teacher? Well, in a, in a, in a, in a culture where most people were literate, the scribes were like the PhDs of their day. These were no pushovers. But in contrast to Jesus, there was something different about him. There was more to him. And that what they identified was he had authority. And this Greek word has sort of two emphasis to it. One side of it is authority as one who has the legal right to do something. It, it was used in that context where you could go to court and either demand that your rights are, are fulfilled. For instance, in a modern day, if you, if you had a property and a tenant wasn't paying uh, their rent, you can go to court and you have the authority to ask for that property back to you. It's yours. It, it belongs to you and you have the right to ask it back. But it's also the authority to exercise new rights the opportunity to take possession of something which is now yours because you have the inheritance of it. This authority is a legal right, but it's also a power to do something. It's, not, it's saying that actually you have the ability to fulfill that which you have just um, exercised a right on. It's from that phrase we this word that we get the phrase, you both have the right and the might to make something happen. But as I was looking at this passage over the Christmas period and reading it again, I journeyed with R.C. Sproul through his commentary, and I, I love the way he comes at this word, and he says, let's just step back and look at this Greek word for authority, and it's exousia. 
ex meaning to come out of or to uh, move away from. But exousia coming from the root word to be or a being. What he's actually saying is this exousia word is, is to have substance. And the authority that Jesus has is more than just a legal right or the ability to exercise his rights, but it's because of in his substance he has authority from his very being. You see, all these other teachers taught from a place of learning. Jesus was expressing from his personhood. So when Jesus takes control of the storm, and when Jesus speaks over nature, he can because he was the creator of creation. He reconciles because he is forgiveness embodied in human form. He heals because he is our very healing. And he brings life and overcomes death because he is the victor of death. When I was a child, I guess my first experience of authority outside of the home, and it might be true for you, was when we go to school. And I remember uh, going to school and being told about teachers and uh, the authority they would have over my life. Not that those were the words my parents used, but I understood authority, I guess, in three ways. One would be, and it's true for us, that we can understand authority in a tradition, in the sense of, you know, listen to your teachers, Tony, and do what you're told. I was understood that that's what was expected of me. I also then progressed to realise that actually if I listen to these teachers, they might do me some good. Authority understood through reason. And I guess also some authority experience for experience, that if I didn't listen to my teacher, whoa, there was problems to come and a few visits to the head teacher's office uh, were in my history as well. Authority learnt through tradition, through experience and through reason. But when I went to secondary school, uh, we started lots of different subjects and I have learnt and in, in my adult life I love history. And in many ways the reason I love history is I met a teacher, a lady called Mrs Vashner and she was my history teacher. And uh, we were doing history like I'd never done before, and we were studying the history of nations and what makes a nation and how nations are formed. And Mrs. Vashner had grown up through the uh, birth of the Indian nation. She had experienced in the independence of a nation in 1947, the end of 200 years of British rule, she had gone on marches with Gandhi, her and her family. She was a child and a teenager at the time. And she told stories of this, of listening and sitting um, uh, uh, under uh, uh, rallies and teaching and, and walks. She was there where the British flag was lowered and for the first time the flag of India was raised. You see, she taught me as someone with substance because it was her life. It was the journey she'd been on. And something happened that day on that, that term that drew me to love history because it was something of her imparted to us. People were amazed and astonished when Jesus taught, and they still are. If you encounter Jesus today, you will be amazed and astonished by him. Whenever the immediacy of Jesus enters our lives... His substance causes us to be astonished and amazed by him. Throughout the last year, we have been running a number of spontaneous online alpha courses. And this week, I was just chatting to um, uh, Julian in the office. And uh, he was telling me how this week's alpha had gone and another person has come to faith. They have encountered the immediacy of Jesus entering their life and they are amazed by him and their life will no longer be the same. His substance has entered their life. 
And if you're watching us today and, and you're looking in on church and, and you're in this new year thinking, actually, what's the new year got for me? And is there a spiritual dimension to my life? Can I say to you, we are running Alpha courses all the time. If you're part of our church and you're thinking, actually, well, how can I be sharing my faith this time? Can I encourage you, run an Alpha course. Invite a few friends, do it online, do it through Zoom. We can help you, we can give you some uh, encouragement how to do that. The courses are there. And you too can introduce people to this immediate presence of Jesus and his authority and presence will be shown in other people's lives. As part of our service today, Tony Hunt shared um, a prophetic sense that he had come into this new year where he talked about the mantle of God's blessing. Now, that's a great word. It's a great word that God has blessings for us this year. And uh, I want to say that Tony's not saying that your year won't be without problems. But what he's saying is this encompassing presence of Jesus this mantle of Jesus, this authority of Jesus can surround you today and it always brings his presence and it brings a blessing to us. The other people that are in our reading today, you have the people in the synagogue, but you have within this man the unclean spirits or the demons and their reaction to Jesus was a complete contrast. What have you with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know that you are the Holy One of God. I love Jesus' response. And it's a great template of always how we respond to those voices of negativity in our head or actual demonic voices and and, and manifestations in front of us. He does two things. He first of all says, be silent. Actually, in truth, the ESV calmed it down. During the um, American uh, presidential elections recently in one of the presidential debates, um, president-elect, as I speak, and uh, in a couple of days' time, um, the new president of the United States, Joe Biden, turned to uh, the current president of the United States, Donald Trump, and in, 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 in frustration just turned around to him and said, Oh, shut up, man! And it caused a storm, and it caused a storm because it's, it's not polite language. But he'd had enough. Whether Joe Biden was right to say that or not, I make no comment. But Jesus had the right to say to the demons, shut up. Shut up. I'm not listening to you. You're not here to be listened to. And that's the authority of Jesus. And Jesus says that to every one of us today whose lives are being obsessed and, and controlled by negative voices those insecurities, those, those voices which talk us down. Maybe that demonic presence which holds you or your family um, in its grasp. Jesus' opening words is, be silent. Be silent and come out. Come out. Never engage in a conversation with demonic voices. It does you no good. You see, actually, interestingly, there's a bit of sting in the towel here in the titles these demonic voices are using in Jesus. There was a a sense and a tradition there, and if you could name someone and you could box them, you'd have control over them. The demons are using two names over Jesus. They're saying to Jesus, Oh, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus who's just a carpenter. Jesus who just lives in the backwater. He's not. It's God incarnate. And then they turn and use this title that we know that you are the Holy One of God. That was used once in the Old Testament of Samson. Samson who was a flawed man who had weaknesses that were exploited by the demonic enemy. And I reckon there's a little test in that voice as these demonic forces meet Jesus for the first time, thinking, we'll find your weakness. Oh, the beautiful irony and the picture that as Samson, at the end of his life, is in a temple and he pushes his arms out and pushes down the pillars of the temple and upon him falls the uh, temple on every uh, idol and every uh, priest that followed anyone other than God and they all 
will crush that day. At the end of Mark's gospel, we will find Jesus' arms outstretched, not in defeat, but in victory. Not in failure as Samson, but in victory, because he never succumbed to temptation. He never sinned. But his victorious arms, his authority, pushing back the pillars of the demonic hold in your life and my life, and he says, it is finished. The power of death and sin and sickness and uh, captivity in your life has ended because I have now spoken. I have come and poured my life out. As we journey together through Mark in these coming weeks, you're going to encounter week by week Jesus' authority at work. Could I just end by saying this though? What you'll also see is the continuation of Jesus' encouragement to his disciples. That which started by saying, come and follow, then led to, I will make you fishers of men. Just in a few chapters' time, we'll find these words. That Jesus sent them out, his disciples, with all authority. The good news for you, believer, today is this same substance of Jesus that resided in him, now resides in you through the Holy Spirit. The same presence and authority that he carried in the spiritual realm, you and I carry. That means when we encounter people that need forgiveness, that are trapped in, 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 in low value, you can say you have value because Jesus has authority to break your holds over your life. You who need forgiveness can receive forgiveness today. You who have sickness in Jesus' name can be well today. Miracles happen today. And as we journey together, we're going to come again to Peter's focus on the power of Jesus at work in people's lives. And the good news is we are still seeing that power at work. Be encouraged, be excited. May God bless you today as we see the God of miracles at work in our lives.
I hope you had a great time with us. Just to remind those in congregations, we're meeting live and local via Zoom as from next week, and you'll get an email or a WhatsApp invite. But if you don't know Jesus and you'd like to know more of welcoming him and knowing him, please contact us through the details that are gonna come up in a minute. We'd love to hear from you and we're praying that you have a blessed week. See you next week.